Greetings. Welcome to our online light service from King's Church Mildenhall. Thank you for joining us in this lockdown period. I hope Hannah Harrop, you had a good birthday last Monday and Pastor Carl uh, last Saturday. Happy birthday this week to Christine Normington on this coming Saturday. I hope you have a lovely day. Congratulations are in order to Andrew and Shelley West on their 25th wedding anniversary, which is this coming Wednesday. I hope you have a lovely day. Congratulations also to Daniel and Kim Portel on the birth of their son, Isaiah Daniel. I've got a little picture here. Ah, oh, there he is. Wasn't that a great picture? Isaiah Daniel Portel, born on the 22nd of April, weighing in at seven pounds, seven ounces. And I believe mum, baby, all doing well. So God bless you all this morning. I would also like to thank the Food Bank team for all you're doing to help those in need at this time. I would like to thank all of you who have supported this uh, Food Bank ministry during this time with finance, with food, with prayer, and those who are actually able to man it on Monday and Friday mornings. Thank you to Malcolm Green for overseeing this and for Paul Glover, a member of our local community who has worked really hard each week uh, with us. Later on in this service, Pastor Carl will be bringing us the word for today. And in a moment we shall join him uh, song worship with that song, Who You Say I Am. This will be followed by some readings brought to us by Barbara Tunningley. But before that, let us pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. Our Lord, we come to worship you. How can we not praise you, Lord of life? For in Christ you have given us all things. In Christ you have given us hope. In Christ you have given us faith. In Christ you have given us love. In Christ you have given us peace. In Christ you have given us sisters and brothers. In Christ you have given us a new purpose. In Christ you have given us forgiveness. In Christ you have given us the Holy Spirit. In Christ you have given us new birth. In Christ you have given us yourself. In Christ you have given us all things. How can we not praise you, Lord of life? Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love for me. All his love for me. Who the sun sets free, who is free?
Good morning, everyone. The first reading today is from Job chapter 42, 10 to 17. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Keren Hapuk. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died, an old man and full of years. And the New Testament reading is from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29. The parable of the growing seed. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Amen. Thank you, Barbara, and good morning, church. Well, it's time once again for... Chuck it in the bucket! Chuck it in the bucket! I hope you're joining in with that at home. Uh, we do thank you for the jokes you've sent in. We can't promise to read every one that we get in out, but uh, we've got a little selection today, so let's see how we're going to go. First one is this. Right, here we go. What do you call a sleeping bull? I don't know. What do you call a sleeping bull? A bulldozer. <laughs> Here we go then, the next one. How do a scientist freshen their breath? I don't know. How does a scientist freshen their breath? With experiments. Oh. <laughs> oh dear me, and I'm sorry to say, this is the final one. Here we go. How do you make an octopus laugh? I don't know. How do you make an octopus laugh? With ten tickles. <laughs> There you go. Please continue to send your jokes in and we'll read what we can uh, every week. We're going to come to prayers in a moment that Peter is going to lead us in. And then we're going to have after that another therapy with Thea sketch where Bible characters are brought into the therapy room. So we come together now for a time of prayer. I don't know about you, but I found it uh, really uh, lovely to be able to watch the people rejoicing and celebrating on Friday in particular, the VE Day celebrations. And hopefully, as we hear from our Prime Minister later today, uh, we might be able to have something to celebrate as parts of the lockdown become hopefully unlocked. But of course, we do have somebody who we can rejoice in at all times. So we come together today to bring prayers of praise and confession and of hope to our God, the same 75 years ago, yesterday, today, and forever. And I just invite you into this opening prayer of praise. Uh, as you hear the words, we praise, say together, your holy name. Let us pray. Eternal God, the God of all ages, and our Father in heaven, the God of life whose love enfolds us, whose spirit fills us, we praise your holy name. And God of joy whose sunrise wakes us and sunset amazes us, we praise 
your holy name. God of hope, whose promise sustains us, whose power upholds us, we praise your holy name. And God of love, whose patience humbles us, whose touch can heal us, we praise your holy name. God of peace, who breaks down barriers and walls that divide us, we praise your holy name. And God of eternity, who has always loved us and by his grace has saved us, we praise your holy name. And Lord, as we come with prayers of praise, we also join in prayers of thanksgiving to you for the courageous service and sacrifice of those who some 75 years ago brought peace to Europe. And we want to give thanks for those who continue to work for peace and liberty throughout the world, for our armed forces, for all who strive to bring an end to injustice and oppression. And Lord, we bless you and give you thanks for the many blessings that we enjoy as a result of the sacrifices which have been made for peace. Lord, we confess that we have so often taken these blessings, taken these costly, hard-fought freedoms and benefits, and we have used them selfishly and greedily for our own ends. We seek your forgiveness for our faults in our words and our actions. And as we pray together in prayer of confession, I'd invite you to join with me in this prayer. Let's own this prayer together and invite you to read out the words as indicated. Our lives are often marked by merriment, but beneath that looms the other. Our worry, our sorrow, our shame, our guilt, our grief. Let us hand over all that to the one who offers us not condemnation, but joy. O oh Lord, in this moment, as my mind wanders, God, redirect my thoughts to you. And in this week, as I walk your path and sometimes stumble, O oh Lord, God, make your way clear. In our communities, where we have sometimes remained silent, God, open our lips to speak for justice. And in this world, where there is much hurt, hurt that we sometimes cause, God, make us agents of healing. And in this time, where there is so much sorrow and grief, God, send us out to be ambassadors of hope and joy. And in these moments of silence, God, hear our prayers. And our Father, we want to thank you that in a world of despair at times, you are our hope. In a world of darkness, you are our light. In a world of sorrow, you are our joy. Jesus, the hope of all who trust you, the power of all who serve you, the wisdom of all who follow you, the uniter of all who worship you. Fill us with strength and boldness according to your promises that we might reach our needy nation with your love and with your sure and certain hope. We hereby acknowledge our weakness and failure, but our eyes are fixed on you. Fulfill your purposes and plans that your name may be honoured in our land. Help us to share the hope of our hearts with one another. Enable us to give hope to others through your work amongst us individually and as King's Church. Use us to transform our lives and our community, even our nation, and to spread your hope. And may our land flourish by the preaching of your word and the praising of your name. 
Holy God, our only hope is in you. We thank you for the past, trust you for today, and believe for the future, that all your promises will come to pass, so we can rest forever in your love. Amen. Therapy with the earth. Okay, who's next? Oh no. Right, I'm going to need some help with this one. Oh, definitely more help than that. No, possibly more than that. Hello Thea, right on time. Hello there Salome, always a pleasure. Well Thea, I'm going to get right down to it. My lazy, good-for-nothing sons have gone and done it again. They're going to drive me into an early grave, Thea. We can only hope. Uh, so what have they done now, Salome? It's the same thing as usual. Complete lack of ambition. Both of them. No drive. Not a wit of gumption. If it carries on like this, once Zebedee shuffles off to the grave, I'm going to end up spending my twilight years in a home. And your two sons, if I remember rightly, are James and John. Of course, yes, Thea. Right, and the last time we spoke, you said that they had run off and joined a religious cult. Thea, I prefer the term new religious movement. It's much more inclusive, less intolerant. Last time you definitely called it a cult. Thea, you, you don't understand the kind of exposure this Jesus guy is getting. He's a hit. His numbers are going through the roof. Trust me, Thea, this guy this guy is going places. It's just that, again, just to remind you, last time you said that Jesus was a jobless, good-for-nothing hippie who was more in need of a hairdresser than anyone since John the Baptist. Yeah, you are always so interested in appearances. With Jesus, the substance is on the inside. Or at least his vast number of followers. Well, that's a perk, too. Right. But uh, my sons are happy to just bumble along on his coattails, Thea. They have no ambition. If they'd had a little ambition, they would already be leading this cult. You mean new religious movement, I believe. Thea, you know what I mean. Anyway, yesterday I decided that it was time, as a mother who cares, to take matters into my own hands. So I marched myself up to Jesus, mm -hmm. and I said, very politely, Thea, you would be proud. I, I said, well, I asked that he would make my sons his second and third in command. <laughs> and you were sure to also mention that, as you've said in the past, they were a pair of lazy, good-for-nothing, work-shy bums. I am going to ignore that comment, Thea. So, how did your intervention into your son's careers work out? Well, not as well as I would have hoped. Jesus said that it was God's choice, not his, whatever that means. And then he went on with this cryptic metaphor about drinking from the same cup that he drank from, and I left confused, Thea. Well, if you're going to be the leader of a new religious movement, then you have to be a little mysterious. Perhaps you should share this career advice with James and John instead. Thea, yeah. I've already had an appropriately length motherly conversation with them, and I'm convinced that they are a lost cause. They are more convinced than ever that they need to live a life of humility oh, that's and good. sacrifice. Uh -huh. 
all I ever wanted, dear, was sons who cared, who had some ambition, who cared about the success in life. Have you considered that this obsession with your sons being successful might really be about your own unrealized ambitions? What a terrible thing for you to say, Thea. I am completely satisfied with my life. I have no regrets, but I'm so sorry, Thea. I'm going to have to cut our therapy session short. I have another commitment, a webinar that I am chairing on living your best life now. So you being uh, such an expert on such things. Yeah, I am touched to see that you realize that about me. See you later. <sighs> Therapy with the We're going to look this week at another song for the road. Last week, of course, we looked at Psalm 125 that reminded us about the security that we have as God's people. And this week, you guessed it, we're looking at Psalm 126, which is a song that is perhaps looking back to when the captives returned to Jerusalem following their long exile in Babylon. God had restored them. This is a restoration psalm. It's a song for times of crisis, a much needed reminder of how God brings us through tears and on into joy. So let's read this psalm together, shall we? Psalm 126. When Yahweh restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, Yahweh has done great things for them. Yahweh has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Yahweh, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Amen. I don't know if you've ever seen that program, I can't remember if it's on BBC One or BBC Two, but it's called The Repair Shop. It's a really interesting program uh, to get watching and you kind of get drawn into it. But in it, people bring along their treasured possessions that are kind of, you know, battered and, and broken, a bit like what I've got here, really. And it's quite amazing. They bring them to this repair shop and uh, they are totally and amazingly restored. It's wonderful to watch the skill that they use in that restoration. Now, I'm not really sure what I could do with this, but I'll give it a go. Well, it's not brilliant, but it's the best I could do in the time that I had. You know, we all go through difficult times and sometimes when we feel in the thick of trouble or sorrow, it can feel like it's never going to end. When we feel broken up like that violin was, when you wake up each morning to pressures, to worries, anxieties and hardship, and you go to bed in the evening and they're all still there, it's difficult sometimes to see your way forward. You begin maybe sometimes to lose hope and you may wonder if this is all that God has got for you or indeed if you'll ever laugh again. 
Well, in times like these, Psalm 126 is good medicine for your soul. It carries a, a powerful message of hope and it tells you that the times of trouble and sorrow will not go on forever. That God will turn your sorrow into joy and your tears into laughter. And it even tells you what to do while you're waiting for that to happen. It's a psalm about restoration. Now, for some of us maybe watching this, the prospect of restoration might feel a million miles away right now. But remember, for the Jews returning to Jerusalem, it felt very much like that for them too. But it happened. God did it. So this psalm, then, it's basically... It's in two parts and in the first part the psalmist looks back and remembers how God has helped in the past and encourages us to look back and marvel at what God has done in our past too. And the second part, well, the second part is a prayer that encourages us to trust God to do it again, to restore and to renew. And so in the first verse, uh, he looks back at when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. Now we were introduced to Zion uh, last week in that previous psalm and uh, it's going to make quite a few appearances in the later psalms of ascent. And remember last week we said that initially it was the mount on which Jerusalem was built but later on it went on to represent Jerusalem as a whole being the place where God dwelt with his people. Of course in the New Testament, in the letter to the Hebrews and the book of Revelation, they pick up on Mount Zion and use it as a reference to the heavenly Jerusalem of which we are a part. So this psalm is addressing us too. The first stanza then encourages us to marvel at how God has helped us in the past. That's what the psalmist does here. He looks back uh, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, when he brought his people back to where they should have been all along. And when God delivers and rescues and restores you big time, it can sometimes feel like it's a dream. And that's what we see in verse 1. When Yahweh restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Now, as I've said, there are some that believe that there is a reference here to the return of the exiles from Babylon after 70 long years in exile. When under Cyrus, the new king, a proclamation was made allowing the Jews to go home again. 70 years in captivity, that's a long time. And then in a moment, God turns it around. Just like that. I'm sure most of them could hardly believe it. It was like they were dreaming. It was almost too good to be true. They were now back in Jerusalem, back to the holy city, back in Zion, the place where God dwells with his people. And it all felt like a dream. And if this is what the psalmist is referring to, you can see why this psalm made it into the Psalms of Ascent compilation. The pilgrims making their way to Jerusalem each year for the feast would have been acutely aware that this was the route the captives had taken on their return. And they would have marvelled at God's graciousness in restoring the captives of Zion. However, although it may be referring to this event, the, event, the, uh, the words of verse 1, well, they're actually quite a general expression that could cover many situations. And in fact, the same word restore that is used in verse 1 of this psalm is used in the reading that we had from Job earlier, where we're reminded of how God restored him after his time of suffering. And of course, Job must have wondered if God was, you know, through with him, whether he was ever going to know joy again. And then... God did it. He restored Job and made him prosperous once more. Perhaps we can think of other people too in a similar place, uh, a similar situation through the Bible. We might think of people like Abraham's wife Sarah in the Old Testament. Sarah knew the bitterness of being barren in an age where for women having children was their raison d'etre, their reason and purpose for existence. And I'm sure she shed many tears over the years. But when God gave her the gift of Isaac in her old age, she said, God has brought me laughter 
and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I've, I've borne him a son in his old age? Who would have thought it, said Sarah? Somebody pinch me. I must be dreaming. In a moment, God can take away tears and fill our mouths with laughter and songs of joy. Or how about Peter in the New Testament when he's in jail in Acts chapter 12? It felt like a, a, a dream to him when he was rescued. In fact, he actually thought it was a dream. It says in Acts 12, Peter had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Then it says Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me. I'm sure we've all got our own personal stories of restoration and of how God has worked really powerfully in our lives in the past. I recall one uh, amazing and shaping time back in 1995 where God's spirit came upon me in such a powerful way and was on the floor and joy began to bubble up inside of me and laughter came out of my mouth and carried on into the evening and even into the night much to Sarah's puzzlement and annoyance. And if you look at verse 2, look what it says. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. You see, before you can understand their laughter and joy, you must first understand their sorrow. The Jewish captives experienced great sorrow and mourning in exile. Job, well, he suffered far more than most of us ever will. Sarah there experienced the heartbreak and tears because of her barrenness. Peter feeling chained up and useless, taken out of everything that was happening. And some of you may be feeling like that just now. When you're drowning in tears, sorrow and hardship, you may sometimes wonder if you'll ever laugh again. Psalm 126 says, you will. In God's time, your sorrow will be lifted and God will fill your mouth with laughter and turn your tears into joy. And when God does a work like this in your life, it brings glory to God and it brings joy to us. And that's what we see in verses two and three. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. See, what God did for Israel, it was so amazing that even the surrounding nations had to sit up and take notice of what God was doing. And it remained a, a vivid, inspiring national memory. Maybe in a similar way in which we look back at the history of the outbreak of revival in the Christian church. And it led to joy, sheer joy of God's people. Now, we're not talking a kind of a, a pleasant happiness that is some people's disposition. We're talking about a sheer, unadulterated joy because God has restored, because God has done a great work. A joy based on an objective, real, God-given restoration. You see, true joy can't be found in being financially well off or looking great although i do hope you notice i've spent a bit longer in hair and makeup this week can't be found in anything like that true joy comes from being restored being brought back to what you were designed to be and that's the message of the gospel restoration being restored to what you were designed to be in the first place a worshipper of God and it's in this and in this alone that you will find true and lasting joy because you're functioning and living in line with the way that you were designed to be you've been in other words restored to your former glory that program that I mentioned at the beginning called repair shop when they brought their treasured possessions and then at the end when it was revealed when it had been transformed and restored you would often see joy in the people in uh, expressed in tears as they cry and, and they look up and see that lovely thing restored to its former glory and between you and I I did think I spotted a few tears in Tim's eyes 
when I restored that violin not so long ago. The message of the gospel is the joy of restoration. It brings glory to God and joy to us. There's nothing quite like restoration. Not so long ago I was driving through uh, the country lanes early one morning and uh, just as I was going along there I think it was a rabbit ran straight out in front of me and you hear the woof and felt off oh, so I stopped got out of the car went round and there sure enough there was a, a rabbit lying dead on the floor and just as I stood over it another car pulled up and a lady got out and she came over to me just to see if I was all right and she saw the rabbit there and she saw I was a bit upset and she said don't worry stay there so she went back to a car and she came back carrying an aerosol and she came up and she sprayed it all over the rabbit like this and then no longer no, no sooner as she sprayed it the, the rabbit jumped back into life again started bouncing around and after every two or three hops it would look up at us and wave like that wave then he hopped off down the road two or three hops turn around and wave another few hops turn around and waved another few hops turn around and wave then disappeared into the hedgerow well i was amazed i said you know what is that spray and she picked it up and it had there written on it hair restorer with permanent wave so the first thing that we can take from this psalm then this morning is to look back and marvel at how god has helped us in the past look back at what god has done in your life relive it meditate on it allow the memory of it and all that god has done to stir you in that time of sorrow hardship or trial that you may be in now and let it give you a fresh hunger and impetus for god to restore and revive you that turns into the prayer that begins the second half of this psalm you see the second half of this song for the road is essentially trusting god to do it again it's praying in anticipation that God will again do a great work in our lives as he's done before look at verses four to six restore our fortunes Yahweh like streams in the Negev those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy those who go out weeping carrying seed to sow will return with songs of joy carrying sheaves with them and here we have two images the psalmist uses to speak of how God works in our lives to bring restoration and renewal that are both striking and complementary. The first is sudden and unexpected, an utter and sheer gift from heaven. The second is much slower, more arduous and demanding with a crucial role for us to play. So the first picture then of the sudden bounty of God's restoration and blessing is when the psalmist prays for God to restore like streams in the Negev. Now the Negev was the southern part of Judah and it was normally very dry and arid land. In fact the word Negev means dry or parched. But in the winter and in the springtime sudden rains could come and send torrents of water rushing through the desert and grass and flowers could suddenly appear even overnight so this first image speaks of a of a sudden outpouring of god's blessing we find a similar kind of language in isaiah chapter 35 verse 6 where it says water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert sometimes you know our lives can feel a bit like a desert that is spiritually dry and parched and if that's how you feel right now then allow this psalm allow it and, and use it to pray for god to restore you pray for god's renewal and blessing an invasion if you like of god's spirit into your life like streams in the negev and we need to pray this not only for ourselves but for the church too this psalm is a prayer for revival true restoration you see is something that only god can do and in the same way true revival is something that can only come from god martin lloyd jones that great welsh preacher once said that in revival god does more in five minutes than man did in the previous 10 years. 
So we, we need to pray for God to open the floodgates of heaven, to pour out his blessing on his church. Now, how he does this and when is his sovereign prerogative, but it's often in response to the prayers of his people. Restore us, O Lord, revive us like streams in the Negev. And as was suggested by someone at the Zoom Connect group that I was part of on Monday evening, maybe this is something that we can pray for KCM in preparation for when we're able to come back and meet together again. Pray that God will restore us as his people, that we will come back enlivened and refreshed as a church to continue his kingdom work in a way that brings glory to God and great joy to his people. So, so let's make the psalmist prayer for God's restoration and blessing like streams in the Negev. Let's make it our prayer today and through this week and on into the future too. The second image finally is that one of sowing and reaping in verses five and six. And whereas the, the first image points to a work of God that is a sudden and undeserved, the second image points to God working through our efforts. There's a, a working and a waiting. The first is about God working in sudden supernatural revival. The second is God working through his providence over time. Both are examples of God at work, but in different complementary ways. Now we do, of course, I hope, long for the sudden restoration and revival, and we rejoice when it comes. But God's normal way of working is often much slower, and so the sudden image of streams in the desert turns to the image of God's slow and certain work in our lives through sowing and reaping. Sowing seed in the empty earth, as every farmer knows, entails hard work, it involves an element of mystery, it requires patience and waiting. But there is also growth and a harvest, as we were reminded in that reading that Barbara brought to us from Mark earlier on. And it's often, I think, the case that as the psalmist says, we sow with tears and weeping. It can be heartbreaking and it can be tough. But I want you today, I want to encourage you to maybe think of all your suffering, your hardship, your pain, your disappointments, to think of it as seed. Seed which if we sow in God and give to him, he will eventually bring to a joyful crop and a blessed harvest. Are you going through a time of sorrow? Are you sowing many tears? Know that God will turn your sorrow into joy. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. There's never been a sunset yet that was not followed by a sunrise. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. This final verse 6 expands on the image in verse 5 and focuses on the sower going forth to work and eventually returning with the harvest in his hands. And it reminds us that even in times of sorrow, there is work to be done and that good work will bear good fruit in our lives. Now I know that times of sorrow are hard, sowing in tears, it's difficult, but nothing is wasted in God's economy. You can trust God, in other words, with your tears. I read a quote this week from Charles Spurgeon, where he says this, God is too good to be unkind, and he is too wise to be mistaken. So when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. So what can you do when you're walking through a time of trouble and hardship and sorrow? This psalm tells us, marvel at what God has done in the past and then trust him to do it again. Pray for God's restoration and his blessing 
and know that God will turn your sorrow into joy. Commit your way to him and continue to do good. As always, we can see the fulfillment of this psalm in Jesus himself. Now, Jesus knows the trouble and the sorrow that we face in this life. He shed many tears of his own during his life here on earth. Jesus went to the cross weeping, carrying seed to sow. And he returned from the dead with resurrection songs of joy, carrying sheaves of believers with him. And if you're a believer this morning, you are part of his glorious harvest. So Psalm 126, it's a psalm of trouble, but it's a psalm of trouble with a twist. It's a psalm that offers you hope when you're in the midst of trials and tears. It tells us that times of trouble and sorrow will not last. God will turn your sorrow to joy and your tears to laughter. Weeping may endure for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And one day we will leave all the sorrows of this world behind for the eternal joys that await us in the new heaven and the new earth. So allow this song for the road to infuse hope into your soul. And if you're in the midst of difficult times, allow it to encourage you to look back at what God has done in the past as, as a springboard of anticipation for what he can do in the future. Allow it to stir you to pray for those dry places of our lives to become potential rivers and be reminded that all the hard, tearful sowing is but a certain prelude to a great harvest. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the message of this psalm. Minister it into our hearts and Lord, wherever we may be feeling today, in trouble or hardship or whatever, we just pray you'll enable us to look back with thanksgiving and joy on what you've done how you've come into our lives and restored us in the past. And Father, I just want to pray for everybody that's watching this. I want to pray that word restore over people's lives. Father, I pray restoration in the lives of all those that are watching. Restoration in their relationships. Restoration at work. Restoration in finances. Restoration in health. Father, I want to pray a blessing of restoration in the lives of the people that are watching today. Lord, give us that hunger for more of you to pray that those streams of water might flood our lives and bring that refreshing to each one of us. So Father, we place ourselves again into your care, into your loving arms and we trust you. Father, Bring your kingdom. Let heaven come to each one of us this week in whatever way that might be. That Lord your kingdom might come and your will might be done. Father we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.
we come to the end of our time together this morning. And I'd like to just pray a blessing over you before we close. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with you all, always. Amen. God bless you all.